Today on Earth Focus, a global renaissance, technology and the world of the future. Leading thinkers and innovators share their visions at the 2012 Talberg Forum. Coming up on Earth Focus. There is no challenge that's big enough that innovation and entrepreneurship can't solve. We're in this moment right now where we are reframing our understanding of how humanity works on this planet. Um, what do you do for a living? Every Talberg Forum has the same basic question, and that is how on earth can we live together? And this year, the lens we're looking at is the evolution of technology. We need to be conscious of what we've created as human beings, technology. We need to be conscious of its magnificence, but we also need to be conscious that we are in a universe that is vast, and we are the only species, to the best of my knowledge, that has perceived that. And that perception is not due to science directly, it's due to technology. Take away technology, no modern science, no central heating, no surgical techniques, no modern medicine. You take away practically everything that has created us as a species. You can't talk about sustainability without talking about technology. In our attempts to invite people to uh, spend a few days away from their daily lives, to think and to talk to others about what's going on in the world. We think that this holistic perspective, this systems view, is really quite important. Talberg represents the building of our new world by bringing together stakeholders under one umbrella, literally one tent, from across discipline, different fields of science, technology, business, and humanity and sustainable development and looking at accelerating the communication across those boundaries. I think we're on the verge of a new global renaissance where the greatest quantum leaps and innovations and breakthroughs of our generation are going to happen across at the convergence point. The Tumberg Forum is not an environmental conference, but at another level, you can say that since everything really is interconnected and everything is interrelated, you can't really have a conversation about the future of the world economy without talking about sustainability. We are not limited um, by material constraints in the ways that we used to believe. Um, we know already that it is possible through innovation, through changed perspectives um, through uh, design to uh, take the same set of limited resources and do an almost infinite number of things with them. And if we can find our way to living within a single planet and taking care of the biological systems that make up that planet and creating human systems that have some uh, strength and endurance to them, then I think we actually gain the capacity to do almost anything. So if you look at the amount of technological development that's happening, almost every field, every challenge that you see 
in fact is a great opportunity that some entrepreneur is going to exploit to solve those problems. And one of the things that I always believe in is that doing well by doing good and you shouldn't separate the two things. That means create an awesome business that is making a lot of profit and by solving a major problem. So one of the things I think about is you can't really build a $10 billion company by solving a billion dollar problem. You have to go out and find a $100 billion problem. And those problems happen to be the large social problems such as access to education for billions of people around the world or affordable access to health care for people around the world who don't have access to health or in fact you can go out and say the clean water what if somebody can solve the access to clean water for everybody on earth and if they happen to make a billion dollar would you and i cry i would say my hats off to that entrepreneur who does that or person who goes to the moon or person who goes to the space to bring the resources that we need to make the life better for humanity on earth itself there's so much knowledge that we have about environmental issues, whether or not it's connected directly to weather and climate or to ecosystem services and, and or humanities. But there's so much knowledge collected, but so many people don't know about it. So one of my tasks I see is to actually bring that scientific knowledge and, and make it available for the public and for policymakers. about is there any problem that facing humanity that human beings can't solve and the answer is no and the reason is there is nothing that innovator the innovation and entrepreneurship can't solve let's go back to the evolution from the beginning of time until about 1800 we managed to get to 1 billion population. It took us another 100 or so years until about 1925 and we got to the population of 2 billion. And I'm quite sure, I wasn't born at that time, but there was a tent like that and people were sitting in a tall berg somewhere, they're thinking, oh my God, we have 2 billion people. How, how is the planet Earth ever going to support, what if the population someday becomes 3 billion, or God forbid, 4 billion population? How is the world ever going to live together? Can we ever live together with the 4 billion people? And the smart people said, what if we start sustainability movement? We're going to start conserving. We're going to eat less. We're going to stop using less of what we have. And today, we hear stand at 7 billion population. And it's only a matter of time, by the end of this century, we're going to have 10 billion people. There is no way we can get out of this by using conservation. Sustainability movement should not be about conservation. It should be about creation. We cannot ever think about using less and less of what we have when the population is growing exponentially. We have to learn to create more and more of what we need rather than use less and less of what we have. If you start to raise the awareness of people, you raise the consciousness of people, you see how deeply interconnected we are as human beings with each other and the greater ecosystem and the planet and even the universe we live in. Once you become aware of that, I think you start to see a broader concept of self. Um, and the population issue looked at reductionistically seems like a problem. But when you start to look at it holistically, you start to think of a whole array of new solutions. One thing that is really important to stress when we're talking about nanotechnology at this forum is that it creates totally new possibilities possibilities that we haven't had in previous technical revolutions, the revolutions we have 
behind us in terms of computer development and development of the automobile, the railroad, the textile industries, those are the revolutions we have prior to us. Those have all been based on top-down processes requiring a lot of energy. Now we have the possibility to uh, create new solutions and systems based on really low energy requiring processes and, and we do not require really pure materials either. So I see that we are about to start a new growth phase where we will not need as much energy as we've previously been needing. Technology is looked upon as something very evil uh, and uh, the people behind technology are evil and, and the mechanism that brings technology to the market, capitalism for example, um, is, is a bit bedeviled. Um, I think uh, what we are trying to do here to, is to understand that we the humans live in a technosphere. We live out of it, we live in and we live through technology. Right now we're standing here with a camera and television and, and there are thousands of technologies brought together to make this production possible. So technology is life and technology comes out of ourselves. It's a prolongation of the human being. It's an extension. We want to be smarter, we want to be faster, we want to be uh, increase our well-being and we want to live longer and we want to have security. It's very human, it's part of us. And uh, the problem we have now, which I hope is temporary, is that technology eats too much of, of the biosphere. And uh, that makes many people, I think rightfully so, very scared, very fearful that we are now coming uh, to an end. I think that's really linear thinking. problems that are um, that transcend national boundaries um, almost all the problems we have whether they are environmental problems or um, organized crime problems or problems of uh, in improving um, the efficiency of, of almost anything they are not sitting within national boundaries but legal systems governance systems are we have very few global systems for governing global problems and that is where we see problems. There's nothing that focuses the mind like hanging you know and all of a sudden something definitely bad is going to happen to our planet and then all consciousness will be will be raised and there'll be a concerted attempt at, at solving these issues but it's something that's, that's going to uh, depend upon breaking, uh, breaking down national barriers. Uh, just as we're moving in a, towards a century of increased interdisciplinarity, blurring of boundaries between the arts and the sciences and, and engineering, which is happening as we stand here, we also have to blur national boundaries as well. If we look back over the recent past, I think it gives us some clues to how we got where we are and what it means to be here. We spent the first half of the last century uh, basically 
at war with ourselves, right? If you were gonna write the story of the first half of the 20th century, it would really have to be humanity at war with itself. We're in a different stage now. Uh, I think in the last 50 years, the story has actually now become humanity at war with the future. We are, with almost our every action, uh, fighting the future. Uh, if aliens were to arrive on Earth and said, we're going to change your climate, wipe out a third of the species on your planet, melt your ice caps, impoverish billions, require hundreds of millions more to move as climate refugees, and unleash famine and epidemic disease, we would say, it's on, this is war. Right? We would be sending jets to fight those aliens. But that is exactly what we are doing to the future. The people of the future are on the receiving end of that from us. So we need to start looking at these things in some new lights because the solutions we have used up till now uh, don't, haven't actually changed anything. Right? We've had four decades of discussion about sustainability and sustainable development. We are a more peaceful planet than we have been in a very long time. And today, the descendants of the people who shot each other on the battlefield are showing up and partying together. They're creating businesses, they're marrying, they're migrating, uh, they're, they're creating culture. Right? They're taking seriously the idea that they should make love, not war. And I think that by 2050, we're going to need to have shown the young people coming up that we're willing to do something similar, that we're willing to declare peace in the war on the future, that we're willing to make love, not carbon. And I think we'll only do that if we seize new ways of looking at things. So thank you very much. And have you taken part in any interesting discussions on the future of the planet? Yes. Maybe robots are the answer to the problems we face. Technology is not something to be scared of. Yes, it is frightening. And what's frightening is uh, how we, um, some say, succumb to technology. But I think it, it is an ally. And um, as we learned from the, from the sessions here, that the goal of technology is to improve upon our humanity. And I think. Uh, we are on the right path, actually. New technologies are a significant potential in the search for solutions. So technology is a tool. It's, um, it's a system of tools that we have developed and it's like an extension of ourselves. It helps us do what we need to do. Um, but how we use it, that's, that's the interesting question. Half of the new generating capacity added in the world every year since 2008 has been renewable simply because uh, these technologies now are cheaper and have less financial risk than the big coal and nuclear plants, so they're getting the money instead. Uh, I find this very encouraging that the markets actually respond rather nimbly when they realize that the, the developers can make more money at less risk and provide better service at lower cost and improve everybody's security just by making different choices. I think in much the same way that cell phones and computers have, have taken over, uh, we will find these little granular modular technologies uh, of efficiency and renewables uh, replacing the uh, old energy technologies that, that created our wealth. They've enriched the lives of billions. Uh, basically, we are reinventing fire. Uh, you know, f fire made us human, fossil fuels made us modern. Now we're inventing a new fire that also makes us uh, safe, secure, healthy, and durable. Very often problems are solved by technologies, but very often those create yet further problems. And I think what happens first in, in solving a problem is awareness of the problem and slowly, slowly we're becoming aware of the various problems we're in, climate change, 
uh, nuclear problems and so on. And then once people are aware, society tends to shift and demand some form of solution. And it's really when social consciousness grocks or gloms onto the idea that we need some solutions that governments move. I don't want to say that they're slow, but usually society leads and then governments find that it's a good idea to follow. I'm optimistic about that. We've always solved these larger problems, but we will have fresh problems that we'll have to run and solve. So I like technology. I think it solves a lot of our problems. We're not dying at age 45 any longer. We live to see our grandchildren. Our children aren't dying. Life isn't so heartbreaking. I like technology, but it's bringing us problems that we're always having to catch up with. And that's been going on for several hundred years. The problems change, but it's always the same situation. I think what we have to do is adapt a bit quicker as societies and certainly have a much more flexible form of government. If technology and human advancement and human knowledge is supposed to solve human problems, why is it that we continue to see this disparity? And it's not just a static disparity, but it seems like an increasing disparity. How are we going to address this? And is technology being used to address these issues, or are we perhaps missing the boat somewhere? If we choose to use technology in the right ways, then um, maybe we can achieve some of these shifts and they can be rapid that will break some of the dependencies we, we are facing and hopefully solve some of today's problems and maybe create tomorrow's problems. Thank you. Thank you very much. We in the nation states have to understand that we have to work for good international solutions. There is a danger in today's world that you make a distinction between the national and international, when in fact the same issues dominate the scene, both nationally and internationally. Let's take climate, environmental destruction. Let's take the issues of migration. How can you draw a line between what is national and international? And what we have to work for is to make the good international solutions. Let's take climate. Let's make these good international solutions be seen as a national interest. It's only when we dis decide that this is a national interest to go international that we really will be successful on what you call global governance. And I think we have to always say to ourselves, local and global is the same. And if we do it at home, fine, but we have to do the same on a global scale. That's the recipe, I think, for going the right direction at this crucial stage of history in which we find ourselves right now. We no longer can preserve pre-industrial atmospheric conditions, but there are still many things we can do. And one of the real challenges with sustainability, one of the reasons it's an imperative, is that the earlier we act and the more aggressively we change, the more options we hold open. I would just like to make a comment to your question about uh, predicting the future. If you look back, we have had twice a century, we have had industrial revolutions or revolutions that have changed the way you lives of, for, for, of people. And if you look at the beginning of each of these revolutions and listen to interviews with people who has been leading forces, none of them have ever been able to predict what was going to happen in the next 10 or 20 or 30 years. When we are 50 years ahead of us right now and look back, we will think that our lives were at the Stone Age level. So it's going to be very, very difficult to predict where we are. Thank <laughs> you.
Airwaves, a global channel of uncompromising stories. World news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.